In a world of Johnny's, Timmy's, and Spike's, we must all arrive at the win condition. Juliana was straight dissed. That was funny. The correct answer is the competitive decks are what matter. Bolstering the economy of our local game stores, which is absolutely imperative if we want to continue to play Paper Magic. Where are we going for spaghetti? Dominaria for my birthday, Ravnica for my birthday. Decks that focus on just, you know, plan A, plan A, and then plan A. Hello again, and welcome back to the Win Condition Podcast, your source for lore, news, and brews in the Magic the Gathering community. My name is Sean. I'm your host. I'm joined with my co-host, Greg. How's it going, Greg? It's doing okay today. Wonderful. (laughs) On this fabulous Friday in May, the weather is wonderful. It's not triple digits here in Fresno yet. I'm kind of loving life right now. How are you doing up in the Bay Area? I did a 30-mile bike ride this morning, and uh, it it only hit like mid-60s, so it was pretty nice. Oh, man. That's nice. Almost as nice as ordering product from Flipside Gaming at FlipsideGaming.com, where any order you make over $10, whether it's sealed product or singles, use that promo code WINCONDITION in all caps and save yourself 10% off your purchase, which will help contribute to future show giveaways. Well, Greg, once again, we have two weeks uh, since we last talked, and we got a lot to talk about. We really do. There's been so much story, and uh, like before, we're going to try to give this to the most meat and potatoes of what it is, and uh, we'll not bore you guys with talking about it. So I'm going to start off with the first story, which would be story nine. Yep. Let's just go and ahead. Sean's going to jump into Slimefoot's story. Exactly. We'll each take a chapter. So why don't we head on into Lore Corner? Oh, gosh. So much story. Much wow. Much story. (laughs) All right. Take us away, Greg. Last time we left you guys off, the story left us uh, the fight in the crater with Chandra, Jaya, Karn, and the uh, not fully awake Multani trying to keep the Silex from getting out to the world. And Jaya had been asked by Karn to help with the troublesome tree folk. Darn tree folk. So at this point... Chandra's asking Jaya to train her, and it's just coming down uh, to being a problematic situation because Chandra had just disregarded Jaya so much when she was Mother Ludi that Jaya has wants nothing to do with her. So as they continue, he asks, she asks Karn, tries to work together to find out how she can be trained by Jaya. Because she needs to save her friends, this and that, all sorts of other fun stuff. So as they're doing this, they talk. A few days go by, and then there's a loud cling at the bottom of the pit. Well, that just means they found the Silex. Well, with that loud cling, Multani's uh, unconscious state animates pretty much the entirety of of the Avamine Forest around them, along with himself as he charges in full bore. And it's an Jaya, army of trees. <laughs> it might be Woody. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, Jaya, Sh- Chandra, and Karn are trying to fight off this entire onslaught, and they're, they're fighting a losing battle. They're not doing too well. And then with Multani showing up, it is unawoken state he is just pure rage because he never wants to see the Silex used on Dominari again not knowing what's actually happening um and then something weird happens everything stops (gasps) pretty weird right seriously why would it stop now it's not like it's frozen it literally time stops and then they see up above them in the sky the weather light with the fairy at the helm and Gideon throws down a rope ladder tells them to get on and 
tells him to get on quickly because, of course, Teferi can't hold this. And as Chandra's going, Jaya tells her to go up first. And she decides to stay. And she uses what she learned from Nyssa to call Multani. And doing so, saving everybody there from the ensuing battle that could have happened. Right. Uh, there's some kind words that get said. Karn tells Multani that the Silex is to blow up New Phyrexia, which is a interesting subplot that we're going to be dealing with soon, I hope. Sure. Uh, but barring that, they all get back onto the Weatherlight. Multani has an issue with the Weatherlight because it's not his seed. It's Molimo's seed. <laughs> so that's interesting there. As they get on there, the Planeswalkers all start talking. Joyra, Karn, and Teferi win their first reunion in Aww. thousands of years. Sounds Hundreds about right. Hundreds of years. Yeah. I don't know. Long Extremely time. long time. And they're all kind of like talking. Uh, Karn tells Teferi about Venser's sacrifice and talking about what's happened. Joyra is there and is like, yeah, I already knew. Which is kind of a sad, somber point. And as Karn goes forward to talk to the other Planeswalkers about dealing with the Cabal threat, um, Joya and Teferi stay back, and Joya has a uh, something special that she wants to tell Teferi that she gets to a little bit later. At this point, all the Planeswalkers have gathered in the galley to talk about the threat that is at hand, the Cabal. And then... Jay shows up out of nowhere. What? I know, right? <laughs> so he starts jabbering on about the fact that Nicol Bolas has planned a planeswalker trap to pl trap uh, planeswalkers on a plane so that they can't get out of it. And that he needs to warn the rest of the other planeswalkers about this thing. So Chandra's there. He's asking about Nyssa. Gideon's there. He doesn't even talk to Liliana at all. Womp womp. Pretty much. And everybody's like, I, I can't. Chandra just had Jaya say that she's going to train her. Um, Karn, of course, won't. Teferi doesn't have a spark. Uh, and Liliana was not recognized. And Gideon's going to stick with it for Liliana. Liliana was straight dissed. That was funny. Yeah, she, she really was. If you haven't read that part of the story, go do it. It's good. And he's like, well, fine. If none of you want to help me, I'll go... Uh, save a Johnny's ass myself. And he plains walks out. And Liliana gets really harumph. And Jaya and Chandra talk a little bit about Jace and Nyssa. Because Nyssa was brought up. And uh, Chandra, you know, relates about Nyssa a little bit more to Jaya. So she could get a better understanding of what's going on with that relationship there. Right. And... At this point, they're on their way out towards the Cabal. Well, yeah. also, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to, to interject here, but the point when uh, Chandra talked to Multani, that sparked an interest, huh, pun not intended, with Jaya to actually take some time with Chandra to bolster her pyromancy skills. Because until that time, yeah. Jaya looked at Chandra as sort of a, um, a nuisance, a hot-headed pyromaster who didn't know what she was doing so she didn't want to take the time to help her out but after she helped Multani then she goes hey there's hope for you I will help you become a better pyromaster and so yeah I'm sorry continue well there's not much left to the story ultimately um, Gideon decides after talking to Jace that he will use the soul drinker to kill Belzenlock yep and uh, they've, they're decided they're going there. They're going to deal with Belzenlock. And then after that, um, the overplaner threat of Nicol Bolas. Right. Right. Yeah. So they are on their way, still on their mission to destroy Belzenlock and free Liliana from her pact. Or so they think. So <laughs> we, uh, we continue on to the next chapter. And we meet... A, I'm going to go ahead and say we meet a fan favorite here in Slimefoot the Stowaway and his story. So we 
we kind of come into to contact with Slimefoot as he's gaining consciousness uh, because he's he is a fungus that has mm-hmm. developed uh, as the weatherlight is being built. And he's kind of hearing people as they're moving around, talking, doing their thing. Uh, but he doesn't know anybody yet, obviously, because he was just conceived. So yeah. um, he's growing. He's in the warm hull of the weatherlight as as he's kind of, you know, like I said, listening to people and sort of starting to gain consciousness. So the first person who he actually is able to discern with their chatter is Tiana. And Tiana's kind of walking around, um, you know, doing her thing as kind of the ship's, uh, is, I don't know, helm's mage or something like that. Um, and so, you know, Slimefoot's like, oh, there's a, there's a person there. And I hear her talking. So she overhears her talking about, you know, oh, where, what is that? Joy Rizal. Um, and he's kind of just in this state of, of developing consciousness. And yeah. then he and it's hears kind of interesting. I'm sorry to interject here, sure. but, um, it's really interesting to see all these different, um, story points that we've already been through that slime foot is kind of there for, but we never knew. Right. Right. And we, it's kind of cool. We get sort of a third party, uh, uh, assessment of what's going on. And as you'll see later, he's kind of almost like a, uh, a therapist who all these characters can talk to in confidence, knowing yeah. that he's a fungus and he's not going to tell anybody anything. <laughs> um, but yeah. anyway, so, so he, he encounters a conversation between Joyra and Teferi and Joyra says, I like your daughter talking to Teferi. Obviously they had an interaction when they were looking yeah. for that artifact in those ruins. And then he hears Karn talking uh, Karn is saying the weather light is so much the same and yet so different. And so, you know, he, he definitely is just, just present, you know, obviously he can't really talk or interact or anything. Uh, and then there's more conversation. There's Gideon and Liliana, uh, and they're kind of talking about, um, they're, they're talking about Chandra. And it's very interesting when Liliana is talking to Gideon and she goes, if you told her about their plans to destroy Bells and Lock, you may have used it to make her feel make her feel she should help us kill Bells and Lock. And Gideon says, Liliana, if that's what you want, why didn't you tell her? And we can just see the manipulation of Liliana consistent, you know, throughout this story. Yeah. And uh, and Gideon's just persistence in you know the the ultimate goal for everybody. Um, so uh, so Liliana continues doing her manipulative thing, and uh, and and so finally, finally, Slimefoot has an interaction, and it's with Arvad, and Arvad comes down into the the hull where he is, and he goes, uh, Tiana. Can can you come here for a second? <laughs> and and Tiana's like, sure. And he goes, uh, what's that? And she goes, I think it's a thalid. And he goes, uh, are what? What? And then Slimefoot kind of pulls part of his stalks out or and he kind of waves to him. And he goes, What? Is it is it waving to us? And then, you know, Tiana's like, uh, hold on. Let me go get Raph. Raph knows about these thalids. And so they grab <laughs> Raph. Raph comes down and goes, oh, hey, it's a thalid. And then Raph kind of starts to communicate. And, you know, all of a sudden he goes, hey, and by the way, you got 10 babies with you. And they go, what? So Slimefoot has already spawned, you know, 10 little saprolings along with him. Uh, and, and so all of a sudden this kind of is, it's not really a, it's kind of a concern, but not a threat. And so kind of the other crew doesn't really know how to take it. And so, you know, Arvad goes, okay. And Tiana's like, all right. And then Raph's like, okay, well, let's just walk out. And then Slimefoot follows him out. And he just kind of starts passing through the ship. And um, it's very interesting because the rest of this story kind of involves him talking to, not talking to, but communicating with the rest of the crew. And you start to learn a lot of the kind of deeper, darker secrets. So Arvad approaches the deck and he says, uh, this thing followed us and it's babies. 
And Liliana comes in and goes, what, what is this? And Arvad goes, uh, it's Dalids. Dalids, this is Liliana. And <laughs> Liliana's kind of just like, eh, what, what, what is this? What do they do? And Tiana goes, so far they, they stare at people. And Liliana's like, well, that's useless. Um, and then she's talking to Arvad. And it's very interesting. She asks Arvad a question. She goes, how did you decide not to eat people? Obviously referring to his vampirism. And uh, Arvad responds, it wasn't a decision. I didn't want to be a vampire. I was turned against my will. And this, this interaction here is very interesting because Liliana is asking Arvad, how does he handle his curse, essentially? And we know that Liliana has multiple levels with her curse that she's okay. dealing with. So it's almost a, a somewhat vulnerable moment, yet Arvad doesn't exactly know what she's talking about. So it's very interesting. But uh, we, we press on here. So Slimefoot approaches the top of the deck and he runs into Gideon and Teferi. And Gideon looks at him and he's kind of worried. He goes, uh... It's a fairy, and it's a fairy. Kind of looks up and goes, "Ah, Thalids. Yes, Tiana says they found some living in the engine compartment." So Gideon's kind of like, "No, nah, that's someone else's problem," and he goes back to sharpening his blade. And so it's funny because Teferi and uh, Joyra, who are obviously inhabitants of Dominaria, are very familiar with Thalids. Uh, they know about Yavamaya, so it's not really that much of a threat to them. But the outsiders are just totally taken aback by his presence here on the ship, plus all the babies that he has running around. Yeah. Um, and then he overhears a conversation between uh, Raf Capuchin and Joira, say, and Raf is talking about um, all heroes have tragic stories. And it's really funny because Slimefoot starts to think to himself, well... I was, you know, picked up with a shovel and thrown here. And, you know, I kind of have a tragic story, kind of trying to build his own heroic story from a background. And it's just really, really interesting to see how he interprets these people's actions and their stories and stuff. And then finally, he meets Karn. And Karn sits down next to, Thal next to Slimefoot and just begins divulging his interest in taking the Silix to... Uh, new Phyrexia to eliminate the Phyrexians. And uh, it's, it, it's, it's actually a quite vulnerable moment for Karn as well. Uh, he says, the others think the Phyrexians are no longer a threat and perhaps they're right, but I feel the sooner I act, the better. And it's, it's funny to feel that yeah. Karn is confiding in Slimefoot, his deepest, darkest secrets. And, uh, and Slimefoot can just sit there. You know, he can wave, but that's about it. So then we encounter uh, Jaya talking to Chandra and Chandra's training. She's trying to hold these little fireballs above her head while Jaya is telling her, you know, concentrate. Don't don't let go of your concentration here. And, right. uh, and Jaya is asking Chandra, you know, what do you want? And based on what Chandra says, Jaya's like, you really need to know who you are and what you want. And She's talking about Nyssa, and she says, I feel like Nyssa, and Jaya says, like she abandoned you, and Chandra says, yes. So they, they continue talking. Jaya continues training Chandra and says, you are going to get your chance to prove yourself when we encounter Bells and Lock. So we end with Slimefoot smelling the smoke from the pyromancers on the deck as they approach the Cabal stronghold where we know Bells and Lock lays in wait. So, yeah. wow, that's uh, that's quite a bit of story to undertake here. Now, do we want to unwrap any specific encounters in here and what that may mean for the story moving forward? I mean, interesting ones, uh, of course, was um, Jay showing up and the fact that there was definitely a different vibe when we read that in Ixalan. Right. Um, but it, it definitely seems like something he would do because he needs to save the Planeswalkers that are going after Nicol Bolas now. And if they don't want to go after Nicol Bolas because they believe killing Belzenlock first is going to make them stronger, then I guess that's what they got to do. Right. And I, I know there's been a lot of, of, of talk about how Jace in this instance is different than the Jace we've seen in the rivals of Ixalan. Now here, hear my point out. 
I believe that Jace is, in fact, consistent. He's being consistent with how he was before. Now, when he shows up on the weather light, he has to consider all aspects of what is going on. He looks around and he knows Liliana is in the room. So he can't just straight outright, you know, start just chastising her and saying, you guys have got to just leave her. She's ridiculous. Come with me because that would just create a whole situation. Maybe Liliana even becomes hostile. So there's a lot of thinking that goes on. He's mulling a lot over in his own head while trying to recruit these other planeswalkers. And I just feel like it's not a divergent from his character from Rivals of Ixalan. He's just trying not to create too big of a scene after he planeswalks onto this moving vessel, the Weatherlight. Um, I don't know. Do you do you do you disagree, Greg, or do you agree, or how do you see this whole oh, I thought think about it's just Jace? Fine. I I think this is completely in his character. He's looking after the bigger portion, and because he's gotten to a point where he just uh, doesn't care about Liliana. Right. Obviously, this seems perfect to him. He could care less about killing Belzenlock because he thinks he can take care of it. Right. I mean, what do you want him to show up on there and say, like, there's Liliana, kill her. You know, get her out of here. Like, no, that's not going to work. Like, that would just create a whole bunch of more turmoil. So, um, yeah, I think that he's still very consistent. And if, if, if you want to talk about how he's – you know, going back to moody emo Jace, I think that's absolutely ridiculous. He's in the story for all of about a couple paragraphs. So, if you know, that. get off, get off that, all y'all, yeah. please. Yeah. Um, also, I think it's very interesting here, Karn's interaction with Slimefoot, and you can start of start to come into his own mindset. Like, is he? He's obviously out here for revenge against the Phyrexians. And you've got Venser giving his spark to Karn, uh, you know, essentially sacrificing his life. You've got Liliana and Gideon going back and forth where Liliana's mm. telling Gideon things now that she wouldn't tell anybody else. You know, sort of almost yeah. confiding in Gideon. Um, and then uh, and, and Chandra's deep-rooted love for Nyssa. Yeah, she she loves Nyssa, and she really wants her back. Um there's just so much that a Thalid who has consciousness, who can't talk, you know, plays a part in we learn us learning all about everyone else's story. And that yeah. is that's really, really cool. I think that's really awesome. So, all right. Well, unless you got anything else you want to touch on, we can uh, we can sort of move on from our lore corner. But Greg, Greg, we have so much to talk about. In our next segment, let's let's bounce on into as foretold. So here we have quite a few news and announcements to go over. Um, we really do. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, um, before we go over strict news and headlines and articles, why don't we touch once again on? the prices of cards because <laughs> in the last <laughs> month it has been an absolute you know a roller coaster does not explain enough of the tumultuous change of prices exactly exactly so i mean we have uh, let's just off the bat start with standard here you have a colorless planeswalker that is now climbing into the mid 60s you have karn Scion of Urza, who we said, you know, pick him up when he was $40. And it's looking like if you did, that might have paid off. Um, he's in like every deck you could think of in standard, in modern, in legacy. And we'll touch on that much later. But um, yeah, he's he's definitely doing himself a favor. Um, were there any cards in other formats, Greg, that you wanted to talk about in terms of just inflated prices? I mean, there's been a lot of old sets that are inflating, Le Legends, uh, Collector's Editions. It's just uh, everything that's got a limited print run is inflating so much now. I you mean, said Collector's Edition. Tell us what that is. So, geez, what is it? It was late 90s. Um, there was Collector's Edition, which was square-cornered magic cards, not for tournament play. 
And up until a few years ago, the most expensive card was like 300 bucks. Yeah. And now we're looking at the Lotus in it being almost 2,500. Man. And they're, they're black border on the front, gold bordered on the back. So seeing this type of change, it's kind of kind of interesting, honestly, um, to how right. it is. And with the inclusion of sleeves, everyone uses sleeves nowadays. Yeah. Cards like that. Ooh. I mean, um, they're still not legal to play with, but if you're playing in a proxy tournament, you're going to want to get those because they take the place of them. Exactly. And of you course, know, with EDH, it, it, it's gotten a bit insane. Right. And I'm not saying you're you're shelling out thousands of dollars to play Magic on your kitchen table, but these cards... I mean, cards, some people do. <laughs> yeah, they have value. You know, people yeah. want to use cards that look like the originals. So collector's edition prices jumping just as hard as original printings which is pretty insane yeah. but yeah so if you're not paying attention to the uh magic stock market so to speak uh you're missing out it's quite a ride i don't really have too much invested in it but it's just fun to follow fun to see exactly what cards yeah. are getting bought out and the price just skyrocketing um these, this unregulated market of MTG finance is is very very interesting and compelling. So, um, we uh, we move on to more sort of nuts and bolts announcement headlines. Uh, we got a wonderful article announcement last week from Gavin Verhey talking about Brawl, a brand new format with Dominaria that. We have been touting as a really good thing to get into on this podcast, yeah. and uh, we've been posting some deck lists on our YouTube uh, channel. Uh, but, but Greg, what exactly has happened in the world of Brawl as of last Friday? Uh, we got our first banned and restricted uh, announcement. Yeah, starting with um, the unbanning of things like... Uh, Oh gosh, why am I blinking? Oh, we, yeah. They got, you know that 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 card that allows you to play cards for free. That card that busted? does things. Yeah, Aetherworks yeah, Marvel, a tomb with one. Aether, rampaging Ferocidon, Ramanop Ruins, Felidar Guardian, all have been unbanned. I don't know if I'm yeah. missing any one of them, but basically the standard ban list has been revoked within Brawl. Except for Smuggler's Copter. Smuggler's Copter is still banned because it was viewed as a ubiquitous card that would be going in every single deck. And so, yeah, that's Just like enough. this other card that was getting played in everything that just got banned. Yep. Sorcerer's Spyglass. Yep. And that is now sitting alongside Baral, Chief of Compliance. Mm -hmm. So Sorcerer's Spyglass, Baral, and Smuggler's Copter are all banned in the Brawl format. Even though yeah. it's 1v1 or multiplayer, it doesn't matter. Um, how do you feel about that, Greg? I'm pretty happy, honestly. Those those cards were very busted in that format. Being able to say, no, you can't cast your general. No, it, no I just play glass, counter course. spells and that's it. It, it, it. They're really strong. Right. And yeah, Baral, just with a mono blue deck, uh, the whole point of Brawl was supposed to be a fun multiplayer format. And when you have the fun police, AKA your counter spells cost one less, uh, that kind of makes it a little, little unnerving to try to play that mode. So um, I could definitely see Brawl. I could see Sorcerer's Spyglass, but you know what? I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, hashtag free smugglers copter. It's a singleton format. You're not going to be guaranteed to draw it. It is a pretty cool vehicle that has some great interactions with other cards. Look at Felidar Guardian. I am stoked that Felidar Guardian came back into play, and it can you know, start blinking your Planeswalkers for you, blinking your Sagas for you, maybe even combo out with Sahili if you get that you know, combination in effect. But the fact that Brawl is a singleton format really sort of tapers down the likelihood that you're going to be seeing a card when you're playing a game. Um, so even though they say Smuggler's Copter is ubiquitous uh, and it can be used in every deck, 
you know, I'm just, uh, I, I think we should be able to play with that in Brawl specifically. Not standard, but Brawl. Um, yeah. Uh, another change that we saw, uh, me having built my Carnifax Brawl deck with my 19 lands, um, they let us know that if you are using a colorless commander, be it a legendary artifact creature or a colorless planeswalker, you may use basic lands of one type. So yeah. if you have Karn as your uh, brawl commander, you may use planes and only planes or islands and only islands in your deck. Now, you yeah. cannot include cards of that color. They still must be uh, of the Karn colorless uh, mana cost, but you may now have more than 19 lands in your brawl deck, uh, which is cool. I think that's a great addition um, to the rule set as well as um, they have changed the life total because now there's been a, a focus on 1v1 Brawl. Brawl was sort of uh, introduced as a multiplayer format, but of course, a lot of people want to play 1v1. And so the 1v1 life total has been changed to 20. Greg, what's your initial reaction on that, that the Brawl 1v1 life total has been changed from 30 down to 20? Um, it makes some sense, honestly, because why would you, it, it just makes for the games quicker. I, but the problem is that there's decks like the mono black rat colony deck that is just so aggressive, uh, and consistent. There's no ability to get around it. Um, I think it's a fine choice, but I don't know. I don't think wizards need to step in on this one. And also... One of the things that I really liked about Brawl was that 30-point life total because that allowed people who have these weird brews, these deck ideas that take a while for them to develop, uh, could actually exist in this space of casual Brawl format. But guess what? Not anymore. If you're playing 1v1, you can't play your fun deck that takes a while to build up because guess what? Those aggro decks are going to take you out. Now, they really I do. I understand that you want to cater to aggro decks. That's fine. Whatever. Somebody is going to have to bite the bullet here, whether it's the aggro decks or, more likely, the creative decks that take a while to build up. So I guess that's the line Wizards is taking here. Um, yeah, pretty much. I, I You know... <sighs> Again, speaking as somebody who built a Karn deck that had 19 lands that took a while for it to build up, I understand we can use our lands now, but there are probably other people out there with great ideas using great Brawl Commanders, and their deck just takes a little longer to build up. Well, guess what? You now don't have a chance to play against these aggressive decks because the aggressive decks are what really matters. Am I, am I off base here? Am I... Uh, no, the, the correct answer is the competitive decks are what matters. The competitive the, the decks, decks are what matters. Yeah. Now, was yeah, Brawl yeah. created to be a competitive format? No. Okay. So I guess I just failed to see the uh, the the link here. Now, it is still it's in its infant stages, so things can still change. I love the fact that they have a banned and restricted list. And uh, that we can play with a bunch of cards that were illegal in standard. So, you know, kudos for that. That's awesome. But I am very excited to see what the future of Brawl holds for us um, well, yeah. as we move forward. Also, another piece of news, Greg. What Did you get yourself a Fire Song and Sun Speaker from ordering a box of Dominaria? I got a play set. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I did. What is the uh what what is Wizards plan moving forward because there was a very mixed reaction to that sort of inclusion of a buy a box exclusive that you could not open up in any other pack. What what are they planning on doing with this? Well, since they had such a great uh receiving of it, they've decided to um they've decided to continue doing the promotional only buy a box. So when you buy your box of uh, Corset 19, there will be a promo that you can only get by buying the box. What? Not to mention, with all that being said, you can still pick up your box at pre-release. 
as huh. long as you pre-ordered it. Okay. Otherwise, you're uh, you got to wait until release. Interesting. So, yeah. I mean, we haven't seen any standard decks, any modern decks, any legacy decks, any vintage decks that are running Fire Song and Sunspeaker. So. I think they uh, they played it safe the first time around, and it's a fun card to build around. And I think it's only going to get better with the more you know Boros cards we see in the next set. Oh, we'll we'll wait to talk about that for another segment. But um, yeah, I think it's great. This buy a box promo for LGSs exclusively uh, really makes it uh, fun and exciting. And uh, bolstering the economy of our local game stores, which is absolutely imperative if we want to continue to play Paper Magic. So I am all for it. I think this is a great idea. You would not be alone. You would not be alone. You are not alone. Okay, wait. We don't need to go into that. Um, that that no. That was bad. That was bad. That was bad. That was okay, very so bad. Hey, also, 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 Greg. Today. On Friday, we had announcement day. Oh yeah. my gosh. The sky is falling. We are expecting something totally out of the ordinary. Everything's going crazy. It's announcement day. What did we learn today? Where where are we going for spaghetti? Uh, spaghetti is Ravnica. Ooh. Yeah, that's right, guys. We're going back to Ravnica. They're going to be going back to Ravnica for the next three sets. So we're going to get Guilds of Ravnica, followed by the Ravnica and Allegiance in January, and then a to-be-announced Ravnica set uh, right. mid... Oh, sorry. Spring of 2019. Okay. Ooh, that means I get to have more Ravnica for my birthday. Oh, man. So, Greg, <laughs> Dominaria for my birthday, Ravnica for my birthday. Man, this just seems like my type of thing. I think that <laughs> this is incredible. Obviously, they've had a lot of success with their Ravnica visits in the past. Oh, yeah. The, the original and the return. And now the return to return. But the fact that they are – they're actually – mixing up the guilds in terms of which ones they're releasing with each set. I don't know if that's going to have any kind of profound impact on the playability of certain guilds as we move forward, but they're also releasing guild specific product. And I think that yeah. this is very interesting because a lot of us, when we play magic during these Ravnica blocks will end up identifying with a specific guild. So, if you're able to buy a pack or a deck or a box that focuses specifically on a certain guild, I think that's very interesting. What are what are your thoughts on that, Greg? Well, I mean, as a Simic player myself, I'm kind of excited <laughs> for it. Uh, it. It's really cool to be able to get all these guild-specific things. Uh, I, I've always enjoyed these types of ideas and the fact that we're going to be getting decks and stickers and pins and spin downs centric to your guild. Man, I'm excited. Do you think the Shocklands will be included in these guild specific boxes? That's a hard one to say. I mean, we've dreamt of Shocklands always because... I mean, they're always great, right? Right. You see Shocklands played in Modern. You see Shocklands played in uh, Commander. Uh, can you imagine Shocklands in Brawl? That would be pretty insane. Oh, my God. I'd be so excited for that. Especially considering they'll be legal at the same time as Checklands from Dominaria and probably... Well, no, Ixalan will still be legal. We're only losing the Kaladesh and Amonkhet blocks. So Yo. can you imagine having a uh, Ravnica block with Shocklands that will allow your Checklands from Ixalan block and Dominaria to come in untapped? That sounds that sounds pretty uh, good. That would be really nice. That would be sweet. It, now, we, we're dreaming pretty hard right now, all right? Uh, now all I, we need are fetch lands to be printed in standard again. Print those enemy fetch lands in standard, and we can play our five color Jota decks like it ain't no thing. So what are you talking about? I already have that deck. Is that a brawl deck or is that a standard deck? Brawl. Uh huh. Oh man. Yeah, you know, 
with all with all five cycling lands and all ten of the check lands. Yeah, it's only a matter of time before they make Brawl a uh, a GP. You know. Oh yeah, <laughs> no, that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> I mean, they're catering to the competitive side. Twenty life ban lists. Come on, make it a brawl. No. That would okay. Okay, if I may, for just a second, the fact that brawl is a sixty card singleton format would make for such great coverage and such great like surprise. Oh my god, amazing deck building uh, moments that I honestly feel like brawl could be uh, a GP Here's the thing. format at you, some point. I, I know you like this, but decks like rat colony are just going to get played. Yeah. 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 Because yeah, whatever. they're I mean, consistent. You could. We'll, we'll, we'll see what happens, but, uh, I digress. Uh, we also got, uh, in our announcement day, some spoilers from another product that's coming out that, uh, relates to two headed giant battle bond. Uh, we've seen a couple dual lands from that set so far, but Greg, we got a couple other spoilers plus a brand new mechanic. What? We did get a brand new mechanic, and it is partner with other legendary creatures specific to the character. Partner so, with? Do tell. Do tell. All right, so we got Per the Imaginative Rascal, and Toothy, the Imaginary Friend, and... They're both legendary creatures. One's a human, one's illusion. And they say, we'll start with Purr. Partner with Toothy, imaginary friend. When this creature enters the battlefield, target player may put Toothy into their hand from their library, then shuffle it. Yes, that is, this is a creature that searches up its partner. So they're never alone. <laughs> now I'm going to continue on with Purr, which is a two generic and a green human creature that has a 1-1. One, one. That says, if one or more counters would be put on a permanent, your team controls, that many plus one of each of those kinds of counters are put on that permanent instead. So this works with Planeswalkers and uh, all sorts of different counters. You proliferate, you put two out. Yep. Seems good, right? Oh, totally. And then we get Toothy, the imaginary friend, which is three generic and a blue for a legendary creature illusion, has partner with Peer. And it says, whatever you draw a card, put a 1-1 counter on Toothy, imaginary friend. Then, when it leaves the battlefield, this is not a death trigger. doesn't have to the go, go to the graveyard, so it can go to the command zone. Right, right, right. Draw a card for each 1-1 counter on it. Interesting. Now, of course, when you flicker this thing, it will lose all counters, but then return to the battlefield uh, ready for more counters. Yep. But... The fact that when Peer and Toothy are in play, every time you draw a card, you put two 1-1 one -one counters on Toothy, um, it's going to get really big really fast. I mean, it's a shame that you're not in the colors that will allow you to draw a lot of cards, right? Right? Yeah. I mean, another so, thing. Oh, go ahead. So continuing on here, looking down, whoa, there's whoa, something whoa, else whoa, that they put whoa, in. I, I have to stop you real quick here because we got to talk about these guys for a couple. One more thing. Um, Gavin Verhey, who is developing Battle Bond, sort of the head in charge, has said that these cards that have partner with can be used as your commanders. So you may have Peer and Toothy as your commanders in an EDH game. Uh, so that means that, you know, Cube while they have... tribal? That means it's Simic. That means that you can have a Simic commander deck with Peer and Toothy as your partner commanders. And you can play either one of them whenever you want and then get the other one in... Uh, well, I, well, what does it say? Target player then put P into their hand from their library. Okay, so you'd have to actually cast both of them from the command zone. But he specifically said that you may use them as your commander in a partner sense, a la partner from one of the recent commander sets that we've seen. I think it was two years ago. But, yeah, that part is very interesting because this is not going to be the only color pairing that we see with partner with. So we can expect to see more cards from Battle Bond that you can use as partner commanders in your commander decks moving forward. Okay. So one of the interesting things here is that, um, well, with drafting these sets, 
they're going to have both of the partners in the pack. True. Very good point. So that means when you're drafting in two-headed dra draft, uh, you and your teammate will pick two cards at a time. Right. Which means you guys get to pick both of these. Right. I so guess. does that mean when we're doing a two-headed giant draft, you and your partner sit next to each other and analyze each pack? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think you're, I think so. I think you both look at each other's pack as you're doing it. Now, that would be very awkward if you were to draft Peer and not Toothy. But uh, I guess you could if you wanted to. Um, but, yeah, the fact that it says uh, once you play one of these, target player searches their library for this card. You could put the other one in your partner's deck in two at a giant. So let's say, Greg, you and I are two at a giant partners. I play peer, and I say you search your library, and you can search your library for Toothy. Yes. Which is very, very interesting, and it holds adds a whole other layer to how you can actually play Two-Headed Giant. Okay, I'm sorry I cut you off here, Greg. Why don't you continue on down here uh, with some more other spoilers that we get to see. So as we continued on with Announcement Day, we get to find out about the Global Series, which, if you guys remember, that was going to be two Planeswalker decks centered on Chinese artists. So, we got them announced today, both of the Planeswalkers that'll be in that. They'll be getting here relatively soon, and we'll be getting later this month. Later next month. Right. And we get Mu Yanling, which is a four generic blue, blue legendary Planeswalker Yanling. Enter the battlefield with five loyalty counters. And then it has plus two target creature can't be blocked this turn that's yours or theirs and then a minus three to draw two cards and then a minus 10 to tap all creatures your opponents control and you get to take an extra turn um what <laughs> that's dumb I, I i didn't stutter isn't that strong that is i insane. mean sure it's a six shot planeswalker but hey wait a minute Let's see here. Wait one second. So for six mana, let, let's just go ahead and take it straight to Magical Christmas Land and say you have a doubling season out in play. So for six mana, you can ultimate this thing after it comes into play, right? Because it comes in with yeah. five. It's ultimate oh, yeah. is ten. Tap all creatures your opponents control. So in a game of Commander or well, Brawl, I don't think it's going to be safe. You tap everything. And yeah. you take an extra turn after this one. So you mm -hmm. get to swing in with all your creatures at somebody. Hopefully, you kill them. Then you take another turn. Guess what? All their creatures are still tapped. And you can swing in and kill somebody else. That's that's crazy. That's yeah, super crazy. powerful. It, it's really, really good. All right. And then the second one is Jiang Yang Yu, which is four generic and a green. And there's a battlefield with four counters on it. At a plus one, target creature gets plus two, plus two, until end of turn. Not bad. Right. At a minus one, if you don't control a creature named Mawu, create a legendary 3-3 three, three green hound creature token named Mawu. <gasps> you get a 3-3. Three, three. That seems pretty good. Yep. And it's a hound. It's not a beast. Talk oh. about new. Are you hungry like the wolf? Hungry like the wolf. <laughs> and then in a minus five, until end of turn, target creature gains trample and gets plus X plus X, where X is the number of lands you can choose. Lands in a green deck. That could yeah. get pretty big. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, it's just these, these are great. And um, I mean, I think between the two of these, Mu Yan Ling is definitely more powerful. Um, I think Jiang Yang Yu is uh is it could have its place in a certain deck, but essentially what you're doing when you play him is you're tapping five to either give a creature plus two plus two till end of turn mm -hmm. or create a three three. Um it seems a little underwhelming, but we haven't seen the rest of the deck yet. Maybe there's other stuff that this actually synergizes pretty well with. Um yeah. so I we'll don't have know, to wait and see that. I, I love me some Mu Liang or Mu Yang Ling. Um, I can't wait to get my hands on a copy of her and throw her into a commander deck. Well, yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. So, 
All right. Well, in the in the spirit of uh, previews or spoilers, however you want to call it, we're going to continue on down here. We had a lot of cards that were uh, leaked, spoiled, blah, 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 whatever you want to call it, for uh, Core Set 2019. And there's one card in here that really sparked my interest. And it's not necessarily from a functionality standpoint. It's from a story slash flavor standpoint. And that is we get Onake Ogre for two and a red. You get a 4-2 creature, Ogre Warrior. And the flavor text reads, the ogres you know are nothing like the Onake, possessing both intellect and industry. They had brute strength without being brutish. The fact that this card is called Onake Ogre, and we're approaching the point when Liliana will defeat her final demon and get that power of the chain veil, and Nicol Bolas will take her take her take control of her. Are we going to start to see a flourishing of the Anake? Are they going to come out with a presence with some insanely powerful cards? I am excited. I can't wait to see the next uh, allusion to the Anake that we see with this 2019 set coming out here. Um, Greg, what 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 do you think of this? Are you, do you think the Yunaki are going to be coming in full force? Is this just a one card thing, or what are your what are your hey, thoughts? It's hard to say. I mean, we've seen Yunaki in the core sets before, yeah. as like one off. So yeah. I don't know. We might see another card in here, but I don't expect too much. Okay. All right. Well, um, were there any other cards in here? I mean, these are all commons. Really, that they are gotten. all commons. Uh, yeah. The only other cards in here that I think are worth interesting or looking at is we've got that uh, Goblin Instigator, a 1-1 one, one for 2 that also gives you a 1-1. One, one. So it's half of the Goblin War Marshal. Yes. But it doesn't give you a 1-1 one, one when it dies, but also doesn't have Echo. It's pretty right. good. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Then you've got Gearsmith Prodigy and Oresco Swiftclaw. Uh -huh. So that's Theros and Kaladesh. I'm really interested re interested to see if we're going to focus on a plane with uh, the core set or if we're just pulling things from all sorts of different areas. Um, and then from a, uh, a playable standpoint, you've got the Catalyst Elemental, which oh is a my two, two God. for three. I'm so glad you said that. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about Catalyst Elemental here for a second. So for three mana, two generic and a red, you get a 2-2. Two, two, uh, creature elemental that says sacrifice catalyst elemental add red red to your mana pool now we have had some cards uh printed one specifically in dominaria uh it was a i forget what it was called it was a white bird creature that says whenever you cast a historic spell you may return a creature with converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard to the to battlefield field to to char. thank you um there's an infinite combo with that in um standard right now well, yeah, it's it definitely seems like Catalyst Elemental can uh, can see some play. Plus, let's not forget we do have Chandra Torch of Defiance legal and standard to pro provide you with some extra red mana, and we have that Red Saga that can provide you with red mana. Um, there's a lot of potential to do some crazy busted things, and you have Jaya the Planeswalker that can add red, red, red to your mana pool to cast instants and sorceries. There's got to be something there for some big mana red deck that'll do there a lot really of damage. There really is a lot of things to be done. Yeah, yeah, and I know in the face of blue-white control, it's hard to build up for some serious spells and some serious power, but maybe we have a blue-red control deck that's on the horizon that might be coming, or even Jeskai control. Who knows? Who knows? But we'll see. No, I don't think we're going to get many control decks, sadly. Okay. Well, agree to disagree then. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Um, but anyway, um, I think that's going to do it for our news and announcements segments. But, man, that was a lot. Um, we also, there is a lot there. We also have some things to talk about in terms of decks and new cards and inclusion. We had some events coming up. Now, this I don't last think weekend. we could get too deep into this. We don't have a lot of time left. Well, let's see what we can because editing is a thing. And we also <gasps> want to You're make not sure allowed we... to edit anything. Yeah, right. We, we want to cover <laughs> our bases here. So, you know what? Let's just skedaddle on into the Brewmaster's Lair. Oh, 
Okay. So now that we're having our drinks and we've uh, tossed a few back, we can talk more about what happened this past weekend at GP Birmingham. Yes, GP Birmingham, where we had Standard and we had Legacy. Holy moly. Where do you want to start? Well, let's talk about Standard and how Standard was dominated by what everybody was calling vehicle decks, specifically black-red vehicles so they can play with unlicensed disintegration. Holy moly. I think there's like 16. Nine, in ten, the eleven, top 32. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. 18 vehicles decks in whoa, the top 32. How many of those are white black? Well, okay. Yeah, you got to spread between white black and black red. Um, the, 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 the top performing dog here would be black red vehicles. The first oh, white yeah. black vehicles that we have is in, I want to say, what is this? 14th 12th or 13th. Place. Yeah, something yeah, like that. 14th place. So... What exactly makes up a black red vehicles deck? And it's funny because we say vehicles in a multiple sense when in reality um, it's only running it's, one vehicle. <laughs> yeah, hard to cure in and um that's about it. Yep. Uh so the number one deck, of course, was running a two of Glory Glorybringer, four goblin chain whirlers, which if you haven't played with that card, it is busted. It's really uh, good. PNLR, Rekindling Phoenix, Scrap Heath Scrounger, Soul Scar Mage, Walking Ballista. So pretty much your everything looking at in the main deck, other than Scrap Heath Scrounger, is red. Right. And did you see the median price on Walking Ballista? Oh yeah, they're they're up to twenties now. That's crazy. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, this, this deck is, is really, really powerful. And, um, if you got a chance to watch it in the finals, uh, against its blue, white control counterpart, this deck eventually will just be able to deploy such powerful threats on such a consistent basis that even a control deck cannot match it one for one. Uh, it will definitely just, just outpower your opponent. Um, I love how the about fact those two Carns in the main. Oh God, Car! You want to talk about a median price? I mean, we mentioned Carn a while ago. It was a buy at forty dollars, and it is now a median price of sixty-seven dollars. This card is seeing play all over the place. Yeah. So it really is. It is possibly one of the best cards in standard. Might be the new best card in Legacy and even in Modern, possibly. It's and what I find very way. interesting about our buddy Karn here is the fact that you read the card. And on face value, it does not look like an intimidating or overbearing card. But no. you see the importance of extended value throughout the course of the game and the fact that that it is a five loyalty planeswalker that pluses to six, which yeah. in this format is very hard to deal with, save a Vraska's Contempt or some other way to exile a planeswalker. Or so, in modern, where a bolt doesn't kill it. Or legacy, where Slash Panther or a Creeping Tarp can't deal with it. Yep. Yep, exactly. So I think that the design of Karn is so elegant that we really can see what is important in a game of magic yeah. as it is included in all colors, all forms of decks. It's just, it's, it's value. We all know how important drawing cards yeah. is and we all know how important putting creatures out is. And he does both and he sticks around because his loyalty is so, so big. And also if you look in the sideboard of this deck, you can see that with the um, fiery cannonade, yeah. It's it's ready to go against some of those token decks out there that are spamming like vampire tokens or elves or something of that nature. Um Merfolk, maybe? Merfolk as well, absolutely. And then you want to talk about median prices. Vraska's Contempt. He has one Vraska's Contempt in the sideboard. That's it. But it is commanding a thirteen dollar and seventy six cent median price tag. That's crazy. Then um, other things. So next deck that that took second place, that blue white control deck. Yes. 
Talk about interesting. Now, this deck wasn't running any Karns. Instead, it was running a 4 of Teferi and a 1 of Gideon. Um, right. It's kind of interesting to see this other side of what people are playing. But the big winner in this deck was Settle the Wreckage. Yes. You see that price, that card spike? It's now 14 bucks. Man, that card is just insane. It's so, it's so powerful. And the fact that you have to play around it means that's the difference in attacking with your team versus attacking with just one creature. And if you're in right. a deck running P and LR, that's super easy because you can pump the one creature that you attack with, um, which is one of the reasons why I believe this black-red deck was victorious over this white-blue control deck. Um, but you also have a blink of an eye. I mean, it's just returning stuff to, to players' hands, but the added benefit of being able to draw a card later in the game, it, it's it's pretty much a, a great removal spell with all this counter magic that you have in here as well. Um, you know what it's missing, though, Greg, unfortunately, is Raph Capuchin. I know it's not playing all the legendaries and historic cards that the other decks were playing, but maybe that's what it needs to overtake this red-black vehicles deck. Maybe. I mean, it's so, hard to say. Yeah. And no Torrential Gear Hulks. I mean, you've got your removal in uh, Settle the Wreckage. Well, that's an instant. I'm sorry. In Seal Away, uh, Pull from Tomorrow is terrible with Torrential Gear Hulk. Uh, let's see here. Cast Out doesn't really work I'd be work willing to it. bet a good quarter of everything that's there just doesn't work with it. So that's probably why they weren't playing with the Torrential, and they were using Gideon as their win con. Right, right. Do you see that four of History of Benalia in the sideboard? I do. That just tells me that they can go and change up when they need to go in the sideboard. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. So. But, yeah, no, I watched this deck play in the finals, and it was just countering everything, removing everything. Yeah. But the fact is you have to have a handle on everything your opponent plays. And the second you miss a land drop or you you miss out on some card draw, uh, you will fall behind. Uh, and if they do stick that threat, uh, it's going to be hard for you to deal with it. The, you know, seal away is good. Uh, doesn't necessarily help you against Heart of Kirin, but um, you know you got your Fumigates, you've got your cast outs, um, and then your Blink of an Eye is to set it up for a counter spell. But uh, yeah, no, this deck is very strong, and uh, I honestly, if I were to play a deck in Standard right now, I would probably want to be playing White Blue Control, just because you feel so in charge. You you feel in control the whole entire time. That you're playing um just answering your opponent's threats keeping yourself ahead uh it's a really really good strategy i love it yeah pretty much yeah and then other than that we we continue on down you've got your generic um black green constrictor uh of course like we expected there is a mono green aggro deck yep and a mono red aggro Right. Other than that, the only other one that's really of note here is a Grixis Chain Whirler deck, because Chain Whirler is really strong. It is. Um, using things like Scarab God, Glory Bringer, Glint Sleeve Siphoner, pretty much your your classic uh, Grixis shell, but adding in Chain Whirlers to get there. Right. Right. And the Scarab God, you know, three of in the main. This card is not dead. This card is still powerful. It is definitely able to do some work. Um, it does seem kind of tough when you're playing cards like Frasca's Contempt because if you are exiling your opponent's creature, that does not allow you to fetch it back with the Scarab God. Um, yeah. But, I mean, for the most part, it, it, is, it is quite strong. And I know that Chandra Torch of Defiance with the recent rules change has been nerfed just a little bit in that it cannot redirect its damage to Planeswalkers, but it's still a very, very strong card. Um, in my opinion, this deck is, is very good. It just lacks the streamlined effect that we've seen with the white-blue control and the red-black vehicles to really push itself to a GP-winning deck. I may be wrong, 
but I think that spreading yourself out over three colors uh, in this day and age, especially pushing triple red on a card like Goblin Chain Whirler, is asking a lot. So, you know, you're going to have to really come with a serious plan with your mana base and how to handle your opponent uh, until you're able to cast all those multicolored threats. Yes. Uh, but a very, very, very cool deck nonetheless. Um, all right, so let's briefly skip on over here to the uh, Legacy event that we had, Grand Prix Birmingham Legacy, which uh, was won by a mono-red prison deck featuring now, two... One more. Well, Karn, before we get Sion too far there, I okay. gotta stop you. I gotta okay. stop you there because this is the oldest Grand Prix winner we've had. It is. Yeah, the guy was what in his mid fifties. In his fifties. Yep, winning a Grand Prix. Yeah, like the last time he came and got in here was in two thousand and two for a red blue madness deck from Worlds. Yep. Yeah, I, I just got to put it in there because it's really interesting to see this kind of alternative deck that, that's getting played. And you're right, it is playing two Karns. Now, on top of all that, this is running a number of standard cards like Hazaret the Fervent, Chandra, Torch of Defiance. Yep. Uh, yep. And then Mountain. And mountains, yeah. Can't and, forget uh, about also, the mountains. Also, there's hey, two sorceress spyglasses there in the side. Just about to say that, yep. And two abrades in the sideboard as well. So standard cards definitely making their appearance known in Legacy. Um, yeah. But my God, as long as Karn is seeing play in all these different formats, I don't know that his price is going to be going down anytime soon. Yeah. This guy is just a um, stud. I, I got to bring this up. I had a friend watching the coverage, and one of the interesting things is dude dude plays Karn, plus ones him, draws Blood Moon and Ensnaring Bridge. Oh, God. What type of a choice is that left to your opponent? Like, honestly? Seriously. How can you decide on something? Uh, it, it's just like, ouch, that really hurts. And then you also see that four of Fiery Confluence out of Commander. Yeah. Commander cards making their... That card super belt. strong. Yep. Just being able to deal with everything. Yep. So, anyhow, Mono Red Prison, one of the decks that nobody's ever seen, um, beating out everything in the field. Like, the Steel Stompy deck is also something to look at, too. Exactly. Which is affinity without affinity. Right. And I know I mentioned earlier it was my error that I felt like I thought this was in the finals with the monitor. This actually took third place. But if you look at it, um, you're absolutely right, Greg. This is definitely very reminiscent of a modern affinity deck. Uh, however, if you're allowed to include cards like Umazawa's Jite and Lotus Petal and City of Traitors and Ancient Tomb, holy and Caracas. That just make and Mishra's factory and wasteland, and Holy what's cow. that in the sideboard? You mean the two more Karn Scion of Urza? <laughs> <laughs> and what's that down at the bottom? Is, is that is that two sorcerer spyglasses? Oh, I thought you were referring to the two spell skites, but yes, two more sorcerer spyglass. This is just oh, it's so good. I I think that this is a wonderful wonderful deck to be playing in legacy uh you do have the city of traders commanding a pretty huge price tag but i mean there's no dual lands uh next to that what's the next most expensive card you've got caracas at like about 80 bucks um but then your karn you know scion of urza oh mox opal i'm sorry mox opal still commanding a 110 dollars price tag um oh, yeah. yeah it is pricey but in terms of legacy decks, this is a very competitive deck that, honestly, in the grand scheme of things, will not cost you that much. And I love artifacts, so I'm going to put my stamp of approval on Steel Stompy. Um, so there's one other deck that I wanted to bring up here because we've talked about Commander cards making play in legacy. Oh, gosh. And do you see Grixis 
Kess? I do. I do. Be sure to get your proxies for when you play in these tournaments. Because the only version of Kess Dissident Mage that is in print is a foil copy from a Commander 2017 deck, which curls very abundantly. And you are required to get yourself a proxy version of this card if you are going to play with it in sanctioned tournaments. Correct. Correct. But Which, man. you know, the judges can provide you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But this, but this deck's really cute. I mean, it's running a one of Search for His Cons, a bunch of great spells. And then once again in the side, we're seeing standard play cards, Chandra, Torch of Defiance. Yep. In a Grixis deck. That double red ain't no thing. We trying yeah. to we trying to play some serious cards here. Um Wow. And it's just really interesting to look at so many of these decks are running like a braid over bolt yeah there's just a lot of cards that are so good in standard seeing play outside of standard right and i'm just gonna go i mean i love grixis and this deck is just it's a dream come true so uh for those of you who may know what these cards are i just want to read down the list of some of these cards so you can get a picture in your head of the goodness of what you can play in this deck i mean baleful strix death right shaman cast dissident mage snapcaster mage those are the only creatures you have, but those are all extremely powerful in their own right. And then for Planeswalkers, you get to run Jace the Mind Sculptor and Liliana the Last Hope. Oh, man. And then Removal, Card Draw, and Counter Magic. That's just pretty much the name of the game for the rest of this deck. So, oh, oh, it's so good. Absolutely so good. Um. Were there any other decks you wanted to maybe touch on, Greg? Or are we kind of no? Everything else is pretty much the same. Um, I just wanted to bring up Karn getting played in other formats than standard shows that this card has a lot more value than people are giving it credit. I'm excited to see it played in Legacy and hopefully soon to be modern. Yep, yep. I think it definitely has a place in modern. We just have to kind of figure it out see the thing about modern right now is everyone's all hopped up on these hyper linear decks that focus on just you know plan a plan a and then plan a and if you don't get it then uh you know you're gonna lose and karn well, really Valakut doesn't... doesn't do that what's that valakit doesn't do that true true um, so I, I mean, don't know. it kind of does, I guess. It, it'll take a very specific deck to see Karn flourish in modern. Uh, but in the meantime, he's seeing plenty of play elsewhere, especially with the inclusion of basic lands in Brawl. You'll definitely be able to see your, your Karn yeah. Brawl decks going. By the way, while we're on the subject of Karn Brawl, before we get out of here, I just wanted to mention a silly combo that I'd thought of in the Brewmaster's Lair while we're here. Do you remember a card from... Uh, battle for Zendikar called Gruesome Slaughter. Uh, yeah, made uh, creatures in control be able to deal damage and stuff. Right, so Gruesome Slaughter says, tap a colorless creature you control to deal damage equal to its power to another target creature. And you remember Traxos from Dominaria? Yeah. So he's a 7-7, and every time you cast a historic spell, you get to untap him? Sure. That would be a ton of fun. I mean, we're talking Magical Christmas Land here to play a Gruesome Slaughter and be able to start tapping your Thraxos and somehow get an engine going where you're playing Historic Spells that, and tapping that him. That could be pretty good in a format like EDH, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, obviously not Brawl because Gruesome Slaughter is out of standard. Uh, but yeah, just a silly combo that I thought of that I wanted to mention to maybe get some people thinking about it maybe somebody's got an idea um, how to actually make that work i've got a but, brew for you yeah but um and it's for standard oh you do i do what is it uh it involves tashar okay that's the four drop two two that whenever you cast a historic spell return a creature card with converted mana cost three or less to the battlefield right skirk prospector okay Squee Ooh. and Goblin Chain Whirler. Oh, wow. So what essentially you do... Oh, sorry, I forgot one. Hazaret's Monument. Oh, okay. 
So that makes it so that your red creatures cost one less to cast. Right. So you have Squee out on the board, you have Goblin Chandler, and you have a Skirk Prospector. You sacrifice both of them to Skirk Prospector, gaining you two red. Both go to the graveyard. You play Squee from the graveyard with Tashar on the field, seeing that you cast a historic spell and returns Chain Whirler. Wow. Would you like to continue? I would. Would you like to know more? I would. Because <laughs> that is standard legal playable. It takes a little bit of while to set up, but, uh, I mean, come on. Talk about if, something that could be fun. If only there were some red cards that you could use to back that up to make a full deck. I mean... I don't know of any other good red cards in standard right now. Do you? I don't know. A braid? A braid? Chandra? Yeah, there, there's Glory a Glory bringer? That's just, yeah. No, that sounds like a great deck and a great idea to pursue. So, yeah, absolutely. If any of y'all listeners hear anything we're talking about and it gets your juices flowing in terms of brews, definitely let us know, uh, you know, any of your ideas, anything you want us to talk about in a future episode. Um, and Maybe Greg, something you want to challenge us with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so why don't we uh, why don't we start wrapping things up here? Uh, let's let everybody. Can I else wrap know. you up in a combo? Oh God, wrap it up in <laughs> uh, an order uh, for FlipSideGaming.com, <laughs> where you can order any product uh, ten dollars or more. Use that promo code Win Condition in all caps to save yourself ten percent off your purchase, which will help contribute to future show giveaways. Uh, and then if they really want to let you know how to wrap somebody up in standard, Greg, where can these fine folk listening find you? Uh, you guys can find me on Twitter at NoobSlasher2003. And Pretty you can simple. find me at MTG underscore Sean. The show is at the Wind Condition Podcast. You can email us, the Wind Condition Podcast at gmail.com. Check out our Instagram, uh, the Wind Condition MTG. Check out our YouTube page. There'll be a link in the show notes. And, uh, yeah, we've gotten quite a few comments on our YouTube pages. Thank you. Thank you so much. I've been meaning to respond to those. I've just been so busy with work and babies, and we had our trip to Reno for our daughter's last volleyball tournament this last weekend. It's just been insane. And, uh, again, we apologize for not getting out to you guys last week, but here we are. Uh, we love talking magic to you guys and we love your feedback. So thank you. We do. Thank you. And, uh, all that being said, Greg, thanks again. Always my pleasure. And we will talk to y'all next week. Or try to. At least. <laughs> <laughs>